Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have an absolutely amazing guest to introduce to you now. Dr. Georgia Ede is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist specializing in nutrition science, brain metabolism, and mental health. Her two decades of clinical experience includes 12 years at Smith College and Harvard University Health Services, where she was the first to offer nutrition-based therapies as an alternative to psychiatric medications. Dr. E speaks internationally about diet approaches to psychiatric disorders, nutrition science, and nutrition policy reform. She is also the creator and director of the first medically accredited course in ketogenic diets for mental health practitioners. In 2022, she co-authored the first inpatient study of the ketogenic diet for serious mental illnesses and was honored to be named a recipient of the Bazooki Brain Research Fund's first annual Metabi Metabolic Mind Award. So cool. Her new book, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, a powerful plan to improve mood, overcome anxiety, and protect memory for a lifetime of optimal health, takes the confusion out of nutrition and replaces it with refreshingly original brain food rules based on sound science that makes intuitive sense and is sustainable. Dr. Georgia Ede, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Thank you so much, Casey. It's really, really nice to, to be here. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for the opportunity to talk to your listeners. Uh uh, it's it's so cool to get to talk to you. Um, we started our little dog and pony show of a podcast in 2020 when every other podcast started. And um, I, I learned over the years, that if you continue building the podcast, people would reach out to be hosting on the show. And so at first it was really cool because I'd get a, a, you know an email from a PR person and say, hey, do you want to host this person? I'd be like, wow, cool. Yeah, of course you want to be on the show. And I and we'd end up like drifting into topics that I had no business like talking about or whatever. So now <laughs> I get like, 10 of those a day. I delete all of them usually after I vetted a person and whatever. It's a few months ago. I check my email. I see one and it says, Hey, uh, Dr. Georgia Ede is an author. I got about that far into the email. I smashed reply with the <laughs> boldest text I could find in bright red. I said, yes. Underneath that. Yes, 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 yes. Schedule her yesterday. I'll fire my clients. I don't care. Get her on. That's amazing. The guy replied the next day. He was like, wow, it was a pretty enthusiastic reply. I said, it, I replied to him back and said, dude, if I could make fireworks shoot out of your computer and have a, like <laughs> elephants parade in your living room, I would do that. Like, we'd be terribly destructive, but like, I'm very excited. I am clearly not paying you enough. <laughs> <laughs> I really did reply that to him and I have a raise. <laughs> Well, That's I was telling very, you, very, I'm... very nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's it's very true. I, you're somebody that I followed for a very long time. In 2018, um, I was kind of getting into this space. I'd been a trainer for a decade, and you know, I had read Nina's book uh, earlier than that, and I knew fat was okay. But you know, I, I was learning. We did this weight loss contest at our our gym that we were working at. It was terribly ineffective. Um, the compliance rate was very, very low, and it sucked. And we hated it. And we had to do it every quarter. And we had some guy who did a, a ketogenic diet, and he one, he signed up with us. So we got honored for doing that. And we're like, wow, what's this? And I remember learning about this stuff and going to certain podcasts like Peak Human, which Brian Sanders did, was the way that I got introduced to you guys way back then. And like thinking that not only could meat be super healthy, but also that plants can cause harm was such a novel idea to me at the time. And that wasn't even new for you. You'd known that for a really long time. Well, I didn't know it myself until, I don't know, maybe 2000 and nine or thousand then when I started to study nutrition independently and I was genuinely like you shocked uh you know about uh the, the the real science behind nutrition is you know the information that's actually available if you if you dig into the into the into the science into the studies it, it's actually there for anybody to discover if they are curious enough uh, but uh it's it's not at all, of course, what we hear. We hear something very different. And I think that's why every person who stumbles onto it is so surprised. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Stumbles is a great um, kind of word for how you found the diet. And it wasn't even really related to mental health, which is kind of ironic because that's what you were trained to do. Anyway, can you tell us that story of how you kind of stumbled onto this way of eating? Yeah, it really was stumbling onto it. And, uh, you know, like you said, I, I wasn't setting out to try to improve my mental health. I didn't have any major issues with my mental health. You know, I had things you know, like winter depression and getting anxious on Sunday nights before I would go to work the next day. That was all pretty common. And I had stress with work and things like that. And, you know, things that I think a lot of people think of as normal. And I thought of, of those things as normal. Um, but uh, I was really trying to fix my physical health. So I was in my early 40s at the time, and this was, oh my gosh, maybe 15 years ago, uh, almost 20. And 
the what what ended up happening was I was I was coming down with all of these issues that I'd never had before that a lot of my patients were dealing with things like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and IBS and migraines and it was starting to interfere with my ability to function and so I was working at Harvard University Health Services at the, at the time and I went to all these very smart and caring Harvard specialists and had all kinds of tests and everything I was told was perfectly normal and there wasn't anything wrong. But of course, it, there must have been something wrong. Uh, so, you know, and I left each doctor's office with the same generic printout about what to eat. Uh, nobody asked me, you know, what I was eating. So really what I ended up doing, like you said, I stumbled into this diet because I did some trial and error experiments with food to find out, to see if I could help myself feel better in some way. I thought, well, at least maybe the IBS might be food related. So that's really what I was targeting. And I just, you know, kept a food and symptom journal for about six months and made changes, made changes. Uh, um, and by the end of that six month, everything had improved. I was feeling really well, uh, better than I ever had before, but not just physically. I mean, all of those symptoms went away, but my mental health was better. It was noticeably better. And, you know, my concentration was better. My mental stamina, my sleep was better. My energy was better. My mood was better. And I just kind of dealt with things more easily. Things where I just felt, you know, kind of uh, more even and more positive. And I thought, this diet seems to be good for the brain. Uh, and the diet that I ended up with was a mostly meat diet. Uh, so I thought it was going to kill me. <laughs> in the end. Uh, and and I, I certainly didn't rush out and start prescribing it for my patients because I really was concerned about, you know, it was a high in animal protein, it was high in animal fat, high in, high in cholesterol, lower in fiber, lower in plant foods, significantly lower in plant foods and fiber. And I really was concerned about the, the you know, about the health of this diet. So that's why I decided to, to study nutrition because I thought I need to understand uh, whether or not this diet, which seems to have reversed every health problem I've ever had, and even some I didn't even realize I had, I need to understand whether this is a dangerous diet or whether whether I had never, I knew nothing about nutrition at that point. So yes, it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> Serendipity for sure. Very fortunate accident. <laughs> so what, what was it like? I mean, you were at Harvard at the time. Is that correct? Do I have the timeline right? Or you were at Smith at the time? That's correct. No, I wasn't at Smith until much later, but yes, I was at Harvard at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So not necessarily known to be the most progressive nutrition school on the planet, I would say. What was it like to get this information that, that again, maybe in the back of your mind, you were wondering whether the cholesterol was an issue and was going to cause other problems. But as you started to learn that this could actually be helpful for people's, you know, mental health, how, how difficult was it to start to talk about some of this stuff? Well, uh, at first it wasn't difficult at all. I mean, Harvard's a really big place and I was not part of the nutrition uh, department. Uh, in fact, the nutrition department was all the way on the other side of a completely different city. <clears throat> but, uh, but uh, and, and at first there was a director at the, at the health service where I was working who was very open to uh, me counseling students about nutrition, those who were interested. Uh, and in addition to the work that I was hired to do there, which was prescribed medications. And so I was allowed to, to, to say on my profile on the website of the, of the university health service that I offered nutrition consultation. And so I was allowed to do some wonderful work there with students uh, and, and faculty and staff as well, back when the service used to see faculty and staff. So, uh, but then there was a leadership change um, uh, maybe about five years later and the new director who's no longer there, um, uh, called me into her office and said, this is beyond the scope of psychiatric practice. And so we needed to stop immediately counseling students about nutrition. So um, the pushback actually came not from the nutrition department, um, but but from the actual student health service. And, so that, and that's one of the main reasons why I ultimately left Harvard and went to Smith. Um, but But I did, while I was at Harvard, I took a graduate course at the Harvard School public health, the nutrition department, which was on the other side of town, you know, over in Boston, I was in Cambridge. And uh, they, they have a number of courses there on nutrition. I would have taken the second course, except the first course I found to be uh, so, 
what's the right word? I, I found that I wasn't learning anything or, or I was learning very little that I trusted in terms of the science uh, behind some of the lectures. And so I did not uh, invest in taking a second course uh, at, at the Graduate School of Nutrition. So, uh, but I did, but I did make an attempt to do that. And I thought, well, you know, I, 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 I feel like I'm being, uh, I could use my time better. I could learn more about nutrition if I studied it independently, unfortunately. Yeah, very interesting. As part of our podcasting journey, we've got to talk to some of the most amazing mental health people in the world, Dr. Chris Palmer, Rachel Brown. Uh, we talked to Brett Scher, who's a cardiologist, ironically, but also is big yeah. into mental health. Uh, mutual friend, Nicole Laurent, we've talked to a few times at LA Houston, and all of them have their own personal stories. And they're also experts. And it's really great to chat with them. It's great to chat with you about that stuff. The, when I started the podcast, I also wanted to capture stories of normal people. And one of my favorite recent ones was a woman who we highlighted uh, about a month ago. Um, she was in Hal Kramer's assisted living facility, which I think you're familiar with in Arizona, where he's yes. putting assisted living um, you know, patients on low carbohydrate and if they want to carnivore diets. And this woman that appeared on the show with us is 70 years old, entered the facility, um, scoring a 14 out of 30. On, I can't remember what test it is, but showing like moderate to severe dementia. And she, when we were talking to her, she had already scored a two and had left the facility, was working to be a health coach, is volunteer at a hospital, I'm talking to the seven year old woman who is totally alert and is following the conversation perfectly. It's just so different to sit in front of somebody and say, What you know, numbers and studies and research. This is a human who has completely reversed the direction in their life, is so inspiring. What was it like in practice to see people like truly transform? It's you know, it's still takes me by surprise every time it's still inspiring it's still exciting because each story is so unique and the the words that people use to describe their experiences are so unique and so i'm always on the edge of my seat you know with every patient it's really fun it's really fun to work this way um and it, it's a completely different a different um it's a different way of practicing you know, when you're prescribing medicines all day long, or even if, even if you're doing psychotherapy, I did a lot of psychotherapy and still, I still use medicines and psychotherapy in my work. Um, there's still a place for, for both of those things. But when you're practicing conventionally, it feels like kind of a top down, kind of a, you know, that there's kind of an imbalance in the, in the power dynamic. And there is uh, very much a, you know, I've got the information, I've got the expertise, and here's what I think you should do. And here's why I think you should do it. Um, there is that kind of traditional doctor patient dynamic that uh, can sometimes still creep into the room. Uh, but with th practicing this way, I mean, I can't change your diet for you, right? So, so you have to be a partner in it. And in fact, you have to actually take the lead. I mean, I can give you the information and I can you know, try to motivate you or, or identify your own motivations. Um, but you're the one who will actually be doing, you know, actually um, uh, taking the lead on it. And there's some wonderful things about that. And one is that when you feel better, and in most cases you will, <clears throat> if you stick with it for a few weeks and most people do feel better, you're going to have such a sense of pride and accomplishment because you did that. And so you took control of your mental health. I didn't do it. So, and it also, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't create that same sense of dependency on the doctor. You know, um, in fact, most of my patients, you know, eventually leave the practice because they're better. And that's very different from conventional psychiatry. And most uh, psychiatry practices, including my own for many, many years, I mean, this is really hard to say, but most of our practices were just filling up with patients that weren't getting better. Yeah. And so that, you know, it doesn't take long before psychiatrists have a practice full of patients who are not getting better and they can't take on any new ones. They can't help anybody new. So mm -hmm. they're just writing refills and providing support and, um, and that's all well and good. But when you practice this way, most people improve to the extent that they don't need to keep seeing you. And that's real healing. That's incredible. And you've kind of alluded to it. And that kind of tells me almost everything I need to know. But I am going to steal this question from Ali Houston. He asked you when, um, when you were on his podcast, I love the question. Uh, what, what would be 
a win before you knew nutrition could help somebody when you were just using the tools that you were trained in? And what would be an example of a win after using nutrition as well? Again, I think you've kind of already alluded to it, but I love the question. I love the answer. That Yeah, Allie's great. Um, and, and it is a great question. So, you know, before when I practiced conventionally, a win would be, say, for example, I had somebody with a serious mental illness, especially somebody with a, with a psychotic illness. I mean, I can think of hundreds of people. Um, uh, th this story would apply to hundreds of people. Uh, over the years, um, say I had somebody with serious mental illness, like bipolar disorder or, or a psychosis. Um, those particular disorders, depending on where the person was at in their illness, you know, if they were in a manic state, let's say, let's say they have bipolar disorder, bipolar illness, and they're in a manic phase, the manic phase is often accompanied by very poor insight into the illness. And so it's usually during a manic phase when people will stop medication or they will um, uh, not agree that they that there is an issue to be to be dealt with or that there is anything wrong. And the same is often, of course, true of people with, with psychosis is that there can be very poor insight into uh, not only um, the events that are going on around them and with the people around them, you know, different a different view of reality, but also um, uh, poor insight into the fact that there there is something wrong that needs treatment. Um, and so again, that, that person may be difficult to convince, say, to try a medication or to stay on a medication. So a win back then, um, would, it would always feel like a win when I was somehow able to convince somebody who really needed help that they needed help and, and that they, that in a way that they would accept. That was a real challenge. Uh, and, and it still is, of course, in, in, in psychiatry, I still work with patients with poor insight and I still work with patients who you know, don't think anything is wrong and, 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 and who don't want to, who don't want to change their diet. But back then it really was, those were the most challenging cases. Um, and because those cases were very, very high risk, these were people who, um, often were suicidal or, 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 or were, um, not in control of their behaviors and could, you know, make some very risky decisions and put themselves at risk or their families at risk or others at risk. Um, so the, that would always, that would always feel, feel like a win. Um, now <laughs> what feels like a win and I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, I'm working, I've been working with a gentleman for, I think almost four years now, um, who has had a really, really hard time, um, staying on a low carbohydrate diet and, um, you know, maintaining, uh, weight loss and uh, keeping blood sugars in control. And somebody with type two diabetes and, and who's already lost a hundred pounds and for the most part kept it off with a lot of kind of ups and downs, you know, um, slipping off the diet, going back on the diet. And this is pretty common with low carb diets and uh, just a lot of difficulty, uh, largely because of some food addiction issues, which are very, very common. <laughs> so anyway, you know, working together and trying to trying to get him back on track whenever he would when he would stray from the diet or the diet would get interrupted. So, some fits and starts, and you know, three steps forward, two steps back, kind of thing, right? So this was going on for a couple of years, the past couple of years. He did really well in the beginning, and then it just kind of you know started to fray at the edges. A win now is him finally uh, agreeing to try a carnivore diet, which I had been recommending whenever he would come and say, this is really hard. I, you know, I, I'm hungry all the time. I want a snack. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, my weight is going up and down. I'm thinking about food all the time. Uh, especially when I'm stressed or I'm not feeling physically well, I reach for something that a food that I, you know, was not on my diet. So I recommended a carnivore a number of times to, as a reset. And finally, um, he said, well, you know, I've tried everything else. This clearly isn't working. Let me give it a try. So, you know, within two weeks, <laughs> he's feeling so much better. The blood sugars are coming down beautifully. They're so stable. I, I follow them on, on my, on, on, you know, uh, he uses a glucose monitor. I follow the glucose readings and it's just a beautiful experience to watch that glucose, which is high and going up and down and going up, you know, 150, 180, 200, 300, and it comes right down. Um, 
you know, into 110, 120, 190. He never had blood sugars, never had blood sugars in that range on a low carbohydrate diet. And he said to me, uh, um, and it's, it, it struck me, um, uh, it really stuck with me what he said, because I know him really well. I've been working with him for a long time. And you know, he's the same age as I am, right? And so he said, you know, for the first time in 60 years, I feel full when I eat. And that's a brand new experience for me. And I just, you know, for somebody like that, who has been just white knuckling it on a low carbohydrate diet, he doesn't need that willpower. He doesn't need that willpower anymore because the diet regulates his appetite and his blood sugars and his mood and his concentration and his energy levels. He's got less pain. His breathing is better. His outlook is better. He gets more work done. Uh, and he is very surprised at how easy it is. Um, somebody with that history, so many of us, and I include myself in this group, you have no idea how much easier it can be if you eat what what tells you, what gives your body the right signals. You shouldn't have to be fighting like that every single day to try to eat properly. That's amazing. 60 years of being hungry. I think that that's crazy. And I love what Nicole Laurent told us last time we had her on. What you're doing is already hard. If you're seeing a psychiatrist, that's already really challenging. Changing your diet is not as hard as what you're going through now. It will become easier. It becomes more simple. You'll like it. And and to have that feeling of just being satiated for the first time, what what a gift. That's so absolutely amazing. You just hear those stories over and over and over in this community where people go to low carb, it helps, they go keto, and that really helps them lose weight a little bit more. But you take that next step if you want to try in carnivore. And that's when like so many different things clear up. And so let's talk about that in the context of your book, which is, I'm, I'm so looking forward to this. I can't wait. It, it seems like every year we've got one or two books that are coming out that everybody in the community is so excited about, whether it's <laughs> brain energy or, you know, toxic superfoods last, last year. So excited for your book. Um, knowing how you kind of separated into the two different parts, you've got four different sections and, and how you how you structured everything. Part of it is talking about what specifically is the diet. You've already mentioned low carb. You've mentioned carnivore diets. What is it specifically about animal based foods that are really, really good for you? And then I'll say the second question about plant foods and how they could potentially be bad for you. <laughs> Well, that's great. Uh, so, you know, I, I offer a number of strategies in the book, um, sort of a low glycemic paleo diet for people uh, to explore um, a ketogenic, whole foods ketogenic diet, and then a carnivore option. So people can, you know, kind of grab on where they feel most comfortable. Um, but the reason why the animal foods, why I say in the book, make animal foods, if, if, if you can possibly manage to do this, because I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, if you can manage to make the animal foods the core of your diet and then build out from there, because that's really, I think that's really essential. That needs to be the heart of the diet. If you want, if you're looking for optimal health, you can get by with other strategies, perhaps depending on the situation and how you supplement and that sort of thing. But if you're looking for optimal physical and mental health, optimal nutrition, um, optimal function, uh, your, for your cells, all of your cells, you want the core of the diet to be animal foods. And, uh, and then, you know, um, the reason why is because only animal foods provide every nutrient we need in its proper form and without anti-nutrients. And I should say there are a couple of anti-nutrients in dairy and eggs. There's a whole chapter on dairy and eggs that explains why they're different, but, the, ask that. you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, animal foods, you know, meat, seafood, poultry, um, there you won't find anti-nutrients in those foods. And so these are really optimally nourishing. And uh, so they have everything you need and nothing you don't want. Uh, so, and, and it's, that's always a surprise to people who aren't, um, you know, aren't familiar with these concepts because it's exactly the opposite of what we're told. And so, uh, you know, if you, you need to, I mean, really what I've designed the book around is this concept of nourish, protect, energize, right? So if, what is a brain healthy diet? A brain healthy diet needs to do three things. It needs to nourish the brain. It needs to protect the brain and it needs to energize the brain, right? So you need all your nutrients. You cannot, you cannot get all of your nutrients unless you include animal foods in your diet. 
you can try to supplement your way around it. We're not sure if that's even um, as good. But uh, if you're eating a whole foods diet, unsupplemented diet, really animal foods are your best friend. So, uh, and the, the protect is don't eat things that are damaging to the brain. Refined carbohydrates, vegetable oils, cassava root, which can, which is a, a, a increasingly popular ingredient in, in snack foods um, because it's gluten-free and it's probably pretty inexpensive as well um, uh, because it, it actually contains uh, cyanide, which is a mitochondrial poison. So um, I think it's really important for people to know that not all plants are, are on your side. So I think, uh, you know, so, so protect the brain from damaging ingredients and energize the brain. And all that means is keeping your blood sugar and insulin levels in, in healthy range. And there is no food that is, that is, um, uh, better supportive of that goal than animal foods because, uh, and I'll say non-dairy animal foods, because, uh, animal foods are very low in carbohydrate, so they can't they can't raise your blood sugar. Um, only plant foods can can raise your blood sugar. So that's where I think um, I think those three principles apply best to animal foods. Beyond that, if you know anything else you eat other than animal foods is based on your personal tolerances, preferences, health goals, um, and what you you know. So you can add plant foods to that core to the extent that you tolerate them um, and that you enjoy them. But are they in, are they necessary? I'm not convinced that they are, um, but uh, I certainly support, um, I support people who wanna have, obviously have a mixed diet. I think most people do want a mixed diet. And so I explain in the book, kind of, you know, which animal, which uh, plant foods are the kinder, gentler ones. You know, if you're going yeah. to have plant foods in your diet, there are some that are really um, uh, pretty easy, pretty easy to work with and others, which I think are really important to, to, to stay away from. Yeah, that, that's great. So, so we know there are those nutrients that you can only get from animal foods that you cannot get from plant foods. I love that you said, yes, you can supplement. Does that work? We don't know. Is what's in the bottle actually in the bottle? We don't know. It's just tough. You're, you're gambling. And can you do it? Maybe, probably try it, but there might be, there might be something you sacrifice. Now, we also hear from time to time that there are nutrients that you can find in both animal products and in plant products. So things like iron, people say spinach is really high in iron or this stuff about zinc. And, and, you know, we know about like vitamin A and that kind of thing. And people will say like, oh, we can find those in either plant foods or in animal foods. Can you tell us why just because something is in something doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to get into us the way that it needs to? Exactly. So, uh, and, and you said it perfectly. So just because a food contains a nutrient doesn't necessarily mean we can access it. And the plant foods are really uh, famous for this, um, for containing nutrients that we, we can't access or that we have a really difficult time accessing or that are in the wrong form and that we have to kind of jump through some biochemical hoops to transform it into a, a user-friendly form for humans. So uh, it's just a lot more difficult, a lot more difficult to get the nutrients you need from a, from a, a mostly plant diet or an all plant diet. So for example, you gave the example of iron so there are different types of iron. Uh, there's heme iron and non-heme iron, and animal foods uh, are the only foods that contain heme iron. Uh, plant foods only contain non-heme iron. So animal foods contain a mixture of heme and non-heme, and plant foods contain only non-heme. But it is much more difficult for us to absorb uh, non-heme iron. So, uh, and, and then there are of course many anti, there are many anti-nutrients in plant foods that interfere with our ability to absorb the iron, even if you know, even if uh, even if we could access it, right? And so um, it's the wrong form, and there are some factors that are working against our ability to absorb it. And uh, one, just one of many examples, would be phytic acid. So phytic acid or phytate, which is in uh, it's in lots of plant foods, but it's especially uh, to be found in the grains, beans, nuts, and seeds that we are told we are supposed to base our diet on. So these foods, um, yes, they contain some minerals, but it's very difficult um, to access them. And uh, so, so the phytate is a mineral magnet and it's designed uh, cleverly by plant evolution to hold on to the minerals uh, uh, for the sake of the future seedling when it's time to sprout. 
And so those minerals, you know, otherwise, because you, if you're a seed, I mean, it could be years before conditions are right <laughs> for you to for you to you know launch. And I think, um, you know, you if your minerals are going to wash away in the water or you know be leached out in, into the soil, or if an animal is going to be able to come up and uh, you know access all of those minerals, chew away at the seed and get the minerals, you're not going to have a, a next generation. So. These are really clever molecules. They're not designed necessarily to fight to gas and It's not really designed to harm us. It's designed to uh, to benefit the plant. And a lot of people don't know these things. And so they think, oh, this food is high in iron, or this food is high in zinc, or this food is high in calcium. It's 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 very uh, difficult to get your your nutrient needs met from plants because of these factors. And that's why you know, people need to sprout and ferment and boil uh, um, the, the foods in, in that food group, uh, partly to detoxify them to a certain extent, reduce their toxicity, but also to improve nutrient availability. You don't have to do any of that to an animal food, um, at, at least to a non-dairy egg animal food to access all of its nutrients and, and yeah, be safe. That- that's a really great point. I'm listening to a book now called The Most Delicious Poison. And it's not necessarily a book about nutrition at all. It's just about plants and all the ways they communicate and they fight and they kill other plants and other insects or they signal that it, it's incredible. And you're listening to this going like, these guys are so much smarter than anybody gives them credit for. It's fascinating. The whole thing is just so, so interesting. Yet people, people don't Get that information. It's like you said, people need to know that, but they don't. What they get is the latest Netflix documentary about how a vegan diet for eight weeks is so much better because it dropped your LDL cholesterol by about this much. Forget all the other data about B vitamins dropping down, your HDL increasing, your triglycerides increasing. But it's this beautiful message of plants and colors and taste the rainbow. And they just skim over all the other stuff. Even things like questionnaires asking the people, like, do you think you want to even continue eating a vegan diet? It was like hardly anybody wanted to continue doing it after this terrible study that makes it into this beautiful documentary that is well done and very enticing and the dude in his lab has been paid by beyond meat it's it, it sucks because again that's what people are watching and that's what people ask me about and you you want to walk through the produce section and think wow the green from the spinach and the brown from the almonds and all these beautiful vegetables they they have to be benign but these these things are smart and they fight <laughs> Yeah, they look innocent. <laughs> they look, you know, they look innocent and defenseless, but they really, they're just like every other creature on the face of the earth, they're, they ha- they protect themselves. You know, so animals protect themselves, you know, fangs and claws and growling and chasing and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so they don't need to put any um, toxins in, in their meat, right? They don't need to have toxins in their bodies. They can use their physical, the fact that they're animals and can move and growl and so forth. They use their physical physical um, defense mechanisms. Plants, I mean, some plants have thorns and things like that, but for the most part, plants, they're you know, sitting ducks. I suppose it's not not the best metaphor, but the but they but they they're stationary, and they can't you know they can't they're voiceless, so they they look as though they're non-threatening, but of course they they defend themselves silently with, with chemical weapons, and you know we've evolved alongside plants you know, for for our entire history. So we do have defense mechanisms inside of our bodies that we've evolved to cope with a lot of these molecules. But number one, they're not perfect. So some of these uh, still make it through. But but two, um, uh, a lot of us have compromised gut health and compromised immune systems. And therefore, even if you know we may not necessarily all the all the barriers and all of the all of the strategies that we've evolved over time to help us cope with plant foods, some of them aren't working very well anymore. And so I think that happens to a lot of people. They lose their ability to tolerate a wide variety of foods. I, I'm sure that's what happened to me in my in my forties. So um, it's you know I think. I don't really want to scare people away from, you know, from, from eating plant foods if they enjoy them um, and they feel well on them. What I want people to know is that if you're not feeling well, it's important to include plants as among the suspects because we're not taught to do that. 
we're taught, well, just the, you know, eat more plants, double down, double down, eat more fruits and vegetables, eat less red meat. And this is, this is not a strategy that will work. And it is not a strategy that has any science or logic behind it. So when I first was, um, you know, my health was deteriorating in my early forties, the very first thing I did was I said, I'm going to just make a big pot of vegetable soup every day. I'm going to put root veg. I, this is, I, I did this for a week um, because I was convinced something was wrong with my diet. So that's what I did. And, and I, I made this giant, these giant pots and I, it was just vegetables and broth and um, uh, every kind of color vegetable I could find at the store. And I felt so much worse um, that I couldn't continue that uh, strategy. Um, now, that's just me. I'm not saying that that's what would happen to everybody, but I'm mention I'm uh, sharing this story because that is what most people still think. And and if you don't know that there's another way, you might never experience uh, what it's like, to, you know, to 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 try a strategy that actually could work. Yeah. And it's just an experiment, you know, so I just want people to have this other option in their heads so that if they want to, they can try it. No, I love that. That's great. I love that you have that approach. We just need to be respectful and not so entitled when it comes to plants and just think they're around for our use. It's one thing that comes up in that book. It, every other sentence, it's like these guys were here a long time before we were. We are fertilizer for grass and trees. Like That's why we're here. Like, just just know that they're not here for us. And we've talked about the plant toxins being, you know, not great in the brain. We've talked about meat having all the things that we do need to nourish the brain, like you said. Uh, one thing I don't want to miss, you talked about um, the gentleman who is finally going full carnivore. He cut out all the carbohydrates in his diet. You talked about his blood sugar. His blood sugar came down, but you didn't say it went to 80 and then to 60 and then to 40 and then to 20 and then to zero, <laughs> right? Like, it got to... 80, 90, and it kind of hung out and it stayed really flat, which is like, okay, if you're not eating carbohydrates, where are you getting the carbohydrates? Your body's making them. And we know what happens when that happens is your body starts to use fat as a fuel source. And from that starts to produce ketones. What is it specifically that is so magically wonderful about ketones and brain health? Yeah. So when you're, when you're burning fat vigorously enough, uh, which your body will be forced to do if you stop feeding it sugar, um, then your liver takes that fat uh, and and th that's being burned and breaks it down into these very short fragments called ketones. They're really just small pieces of fat, and um, and they are they they can dissolve in the bloodstream, so they don't need any special carrier molecules, and they can they can cross into the brain, which larger fat molecules cannot. So so they're kind of pre digested fat, if you will, for the brain, and so the brain doesn't have time to be chopping up long fat molecules, it's busy. So it you send that this, you're ready to burn uh, fragments of fat. These are what ketones are. And so the ketones cross into the brain and um, they can be used by, by many parts of the brain for fuel. And the reason why this is so important uh, for, for brain health is that the majority of us now, uh, depending on which study you look at and how you define it, the majority of us now have some degree of insulin resistance. Between 52% and 88% of us um, have some degree of metabolic damage. And what that means is that we are not metabolizing glucose properly. We're not able to properly utilize, uh, we are not able to pro properly process a high carbohydrate diet anymore. And that's that's sad, uh, but this is this is the case. And so... What, what's happening then, if, if you have this, this thing called insulin resistance, your brain becomes resistant to insulin, which means that the glucose can still, the, your blood sugar, your glucose can still cross into the brain, no questions asked, um, but the insulin is going to have a harder and harder time getting in. And that's a huge problem because the brain can't turn glucose into energy properly or efficiently or to full capacity without insulin's help. So what you've got then is a situation of, you know, the brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose and still be starving to death, which is exactly what's happening in, you know, in, uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease in many cases. It's just the brain is dying for lack of energy. So if you have insulin resistance, which most of us do, 
you need an alternative fuel source. You need a supplemental fuel source to pick up the slack. So when you are burning fat, like you said, and I love that you pointed this out, you're, you're, if you're, even if you eat zero grams of carbohydrate a day, your blood sugar is not going to go down to zero. We make all the glucose we need smoothly and reliably without any peaks or valleys or drama 24 seven from uh, fat and protein. And that glucose will stay nice and even in your bloodstream, um, which is gonna look even smoother than a you know, typical diet, of course, where the carbohydrates coming in and uh, creating these waves of glucose and insulin. Anyway, you could these nice stable glucose levels for your brain, because because there are some functions of the brain which require glucose. So you're not going to feed your brain entirely on ketones, but the ketones are gonna be able to bridge that energy gap. And that's really, really important. So um, you're going to have certain operations in the brain that still require glucose will still have access to glucose. But all of the other parts of the brain that have been sputtering along can come back online. And that is, I think, what, what's happening when people say, wow, the mental clarity you know, the, 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 my, my productivity, my energy, my stamina, I don't crash after meals anymore. I don't crash after work anymore. You know, I just feel so calm and focused and I get things done. And that just speaks to me of, of a beautiful, reliable, steady supply of energy. It's the best. It's amazing. It's amazing to experience that the first time that I experienced it, you know, week and a half, two weeks into carnivore and the stress drops out and the anxiety I didn't know I had drops out and you just respond to things so much better and easier. And you hear that story across the board. You, you can, you can just really sense how much the brain craves and loves ketones and uses them for fuel. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, okay. I hesitate to get into this because I, I saw this, you wrote a chapter on dairy and eggs. You included them both together on your website, it says, I've learned something really surprising about eggs. I I am funding the egg industry quite a bit. Let me tell you, I eat a <laughs> lot of eggs. Uh, an alarm goes off in my house if I have less than like eight dozen at any one time. I got to run and grab more. Uh, what what surprising things have you learned about eggs? I know dairy can be quite problematic for a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people. What have you learned about eggs that was so surprising? Yeah, it is surprising. So I'm just going to reach for this here. <laughs> Perfect. And um, so uh, I, I had never studied eggs before and I'd given a bunch of lectures uh, and so many times people say, well, what about eggs? And I'd say, get back to me. I just haven't, I just haven't looked at the <laughs> time. So I really wanted to do this for the book. And so, you know, I've got, I've got a chapter on meat. So this is the, this is part three is the whole, the whole truth about whole foods and each, and there are chapters in here. The first chapter is about meat, um, meat, the original superfood. And then the next chapter after that, lots of good things about meat. And the next chapter is eggs and dairy, nature's growth formulas. Right. So these are um, so I mean, the egg um, I can I can perhaps let me see if I can find a little section that might be good. Um, all right. However, in comparison to meat, a few of the nutrients in eggs are harder for us to access. The nutrient of most concern is iron. We absorb at most only about three percent of the iron in eggs, whereas we absorb between 10 and 20 percent of the iron in beef. This is partly because the form of iron found in eggs is non-heme iron, and partly because a mineral binding protein in the yolk called phosphitin, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it actually, uh, interferes with our access to yolk's iron, and possibly some calcium magnesium as well. Phosphitin survives cooking and is such a powerful iron magnet that each egg you consume reduces your ability to absorb non-heme iron from other foods in your digestive tract by 7%. It has no effect on heme iron. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just one example. And, and it, uh, you know, it, it really is just iron uh, that, that we need to worry about in, uh, with, with cooked eggs. Um, the other, the, there are some other issues with, with raw eggs, but I think that, um, uh, you know, in terms of vitamin B7, but if you, but if, and protein, so you, 
if you're eating raw eggs, you will have trouble absorbing vitamin B7 and you'll have a lot of difficulty accessing the protein um, because of protease inhibitors. But if you cook the egg, all of that goes away, but the iron issue doesn't get solved. So it's not that eggs are bad for you at all. They contain every other nutrient you need except vitamin C because the, the, um, uh, the chick doesn't need that. Um, so they contain every vitamin you need except every nutrient you need except a cooked egg, cooked whole egg, except you're going to get very little iron. You're not going to get any vitamin C. That's a pretty good nutrient profile for a food. Okay. So I, you know, I am... Uh, I just learned some, but, but I, you know, I learned some fascinating things about the differences between the yolks and the whites and what the white is actually, the purpose of the white in nature is just fascinating. So I learned a lot of really interesting things, um, but really the takeaway is, and I, I'm speaking particularly, and I don't, I don't know if there are any vegetarians in your audience, but vegetarians who are really counting on eggs as their animal source food, um, uh, eggs and who count on eggs and dairy as their animal source foods, you don't get iron really in any appreciable amount from those foods. So, and it's hard to get iron from plant foods too. So that's why I think um, people who eat vegetarian vegan diets um, are more likely to be iron deficient. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I won't edit that completely out. You made me feel a lot better about that. It's a really great thing <laughs> to be aware of. If somebody's going out and eating exclusively just the eggs, you know, we hear it all the time. The eggs are like the perfect food with all these nutrients. And, and that's true, like you said, but, but to remember that there's other things that doesn't have, and you still need to include other animal products. And like you said, in the beginning of this conversation, like that should be the core and the other things can be more supplements. I can live with that. That's fine. <laughs> I'm glad I'm I, your approval. <laughs> that, that, that's fine. I, I appreciate that. I also really appreciate the very uh, Dr. Georgia Ede answer where somebody asked you about it. You said, I don't know. You're an awesome scientist. And of course, you go out and do the research to be able to answer that question properly. Because again, I, I didn't know any of that. So I really do appreciate that. You write about the different kinds of diets and how people can kind of choose whatever, you know, wherever they are in the world, whatever their preferences are, there's, there's different levels and things they can try. And you write about the quiet diet. Um, I love the name. Can you talk to us about the quiet diet? I think it's very much related to a presentation that you gave recently um, that I really enjoyed. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us about the quiet diet? Yeah. So um, I, I, all of the diets that are in the book, the, uh, the paleo diet, uh, the ketogenic diet and the carnivore diet, they, they are a little different uh, from the standard uh, standard versions of those diets. And so what I've done is I've modified them in these certain ways um, to, to make them quieter, quieter on your gut, quieter on your immune system, quieter on your nervous system, quieter on your mitochondria, quieter on your thyroid. Um, just they're, they're, it's a kinder, gentler version of these, of these diets. And, and the reason why I've done that is because there are plenty of books out there already about paleo and keto and carnivore, right? So if you want to do a standard, and and, and I and I encourage you to do it, uh, if you want to do a standard paleo, keto, or carnivore diet, wonderful, right? I think they're wonderful diets to try. But most of my consulting work with patients, um, uh, since I since I really since I left Smith College and and have been in 2018 and have been you know exclusively doing nutrition consultation work. Um, has been troubleshooting uh, people who are not responding to those diets, helping people who are stuck or not getting good results. And in the beginning, I didn't know how to help them any more than anybody else did. But my experience um, and and some deeper knowledge about the, the, how foods actually work in the human body has allowed me to uh, grow some knowledge around how to um, optimize your results and be more efficient about it. If you really need, if you really want to cut down on some of the frustration. So if you start with a regular, let's say you start with a regular carnivore diet, even because I've, I've consulted with lots of uh, carnivores who aren't feeling well. Right. So, um, there are things you can do to your carnivore diet. You can troubleshoot your carnivore diet and take some of the more common culprits out like the dairy, for example, eggs in, in certain cases, um, uh, processed meats, bacon, things like that. Um, so there, there are things you can do even to a carnivore diet to make it healthier and gentler on your system. If you are particularly sensitive, have a lot of damage to your gut, immune system, et cetera. So I, I, I modify these diets so that people who want to 
get the most relief as fast as possible. Don't have to do a lot of trial and error. Oh, let me try this. Oh, now let me take this out. And now let me take this out. It's really frustrating and people tend to give up, you know? Um, so I've tried to whittle the diets down enough so that your starting place is a pretty clean starting place and then you can expand. So rather than do this, which you're welcome to do, and I say that in the book, you can do this, start out here and work your way down. It takes a long time and it's frustrating, or you can do this. And because I have to write the book for everyone, say, okay, let's start here and work our way out. Um, and that has worked well in my practice as well for people who are willing, willing to do that, to pare their diet down in that way. And then, and then, and then experiment to find out where their safe outer limit is. And I think it's a pretty efficient way of, um, eliminating most of the common culprits from the beginning. Interesting. Oh, so a, a question then on compliance, like what have you noticed? Are people willing to do that? Because <laughs> that that's a challenge for somebody who likes donuts. Donuts taste really great. And a lot of people will wreck their health because donuts taste really great. You know what I mean? Like, are, are you able to not, not convince, but help people understand it? We're going to start small with a few foods. It's going to feel really limiting. Parties might suck a little bit, but trust the process. Like how, how has you been your, your compliance with that? Yeah. So it, it, you know, it really depends on the person, right? So you, I mean, people are, are different personalities, right? So some people are one at a time people and some people are all at once still like, let's jump in people. Right. So part of it is the psychology of it and getting to know the person and, and just having a conversation about it. Cause if someone's a one at a time person and you ask them to do this, this, um, well, let's go to the bare bones and then work our way out. That's just not going to work for them. Right. So, and that's why the work that I do in my clinical practice is very individualized, but I couldn't write a book for each individual person. <laughs> so the, um, and I say, you know, in the book, you know, if you're a one at a time person, have at it, you know, here's your, here's a list of single steps you can try single changes you can make to your diet. If you, if you only feel ready to make one change at a time and there's a list, right? So these are the most impactful single steps if you if you want to just kind of dip your toe in the water, but if you're ready to really you know <laughs> commit to say six weeks of a very clean um, diet that has a, a really big chance of helping you feel better, um, then then this is what I would do. So it, compliance, if you haven't taken the time to listen and have a good conversation um, with your client or patient, um, you will get very poor compliance. <laughs> so, but if, but if you already kind of know enough about what they're willing to do and kind of what's most important to them, then you can tailor everything and, and personalize it. Even then compliance is challenging. So, um, I have to, I have to, uh, I, I have to really acknowledge that. I think anybody doing this kind of work will, 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 uh, have the same experience. It's, it's hard, but it's not about being perfect about it. It's about giving it a try and learning from the mistakes when the the diet gets interrupted. I like the word interrupted. It's interrupted for whatever reason. Like you know, you get back, you know, you you learn something and you go back, you get right back on and and try it a different way next time. It's a learning process and a kind of curiosity and discovery process. Um and it's just how human beings learn. We learn by trying things and making mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. That's very approachable. And like you said earlier in the conversation, very empowering at that point. Um, I think about the woman who had dementia and entered assisted living with Hal Cranmer. She she didn't cancel her lease on her apartment. She was going in knowing I'm going to do this. I'm doing this program, I'm doing everything they say. I'm going to do it. And she had that attitude. And sure enough, she left. So it, it, it really is helping people understand how to reframe things in their mind to help them stay motivated. When again, all these other delicious foods are everywhere. It's such a battle. Food addiction is so real. So I, I really like making that really approachable with the book that you've written, the programs you've done. Not only are you connecting with the individuals all over, not only, you know, with your private practice and the people you've worked with, but also connecting with other health professionals and, and the, the, the impact that that can make is just waves. And, 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 you know, the, the waves that come from a, something that drops in, in water, or whatever, how, how has that felt for you to be able to, to impact other professionals out there and, and help other people understand that this is a very viable option to help. That has been so uh, rewarding for me. Uh, it's meant so much to me that 
um, colleagues, you know, people who do mental health work and, and who work with people with mental health conditions, which is really just every kind of healthcare practitioner, that um, my, really one of the things that I've enjoyed the most about the uh, my my career in nutrition has been has been teaching, and uh, not just you know with presentations and lectures at conferences and things like that, and 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 people who've been gracious enough to invite me onto podcasts and have these conversations to reach more people. But the, I also teach this training program that you, that you mentioned in the beginning, and I, I've been teaching it for three or four years now, and, and it's primarily in small groups, like groups of six clinicians live, and we have great conversations, and we learn from each other, and um, it's been so fun and so rewarding to, to, to hear, to, to meet people from around the world, different backgrounds, different types of practitioners who are excited about this kind of work, who have their own um, th their own history in terms of how they came to become curious about food, either their own personal journeys or a patient came to them, you know, and, and, and inspired them. And I just love the open mindedness. I love the curiosity. I love the passion and enthusiasm that these these healthcare practitioners have. Um, it gives me so much hope uh, because you know, sometimes you'll hear online people say, oh, you know, doctors don't know anything about nutrition and everybody, no one's going to, they're never going to listen to me and nobody's going to help me with this. It depends on the, on the doctor. <laughs> and so there definitely are lots of people, growing number of people who are curious about these interventions and excited about them and are becoming more knowledgeable about them and want to help. So that's been really, really wonderful because we need to increase access to these services because if you're taking a psychiatric medication or a diabetes medication or a blood pressure medication, uh, let's say, um, you it's, you'd have a really difficult time adapting to one of these diets on your own without some professional support because the medications need to be really carefully monitored and adjusted. Right. Um, and uh, it can be dangerous to drop your carbohydrates to close to nothing if you're taking certain medications. It, it, it's not the diet that's dangerous. It's the medication in combination with the diet. So the, the, the prescriber needs to know what they're doing and uh, there just aren't enough of us yet. So that's my goal with the training program is to in, increase access to services and make sure there are more people out there who, who are ready, willing, and able to safely guide people um, you know, uh, help people get onto these diets and, and get, and get healthier. So important. Wow. That's amazing. Now that the book is coming out, I, I was going to say like, I know how hard it is to write a book. I don't know how hard it is to write a book because I haven't <laughs> written a book. I, I hear from every author they, they say afterwards, like, I'm so glad I wrote it, but oh my goodness, if I knew how much work it was, I would have probably never started. Um, when you look back now that the book is getting out there, what is one thing that you're very, very proud of? Oh, well, it was a lot of work, but it was, uh, it had to be written. I mean, I've, I've wanted to write it for so long. It just um, needed to happen. But uh, the, I think the thing I'm most proud of in the book is that I was advised along the way, various points along the way to make the book about one thing, to either, to either make it about ketogenic diets or make it about nutrition, you know, the, the sort of nutrition myths or um, make it about carnivore diets or, you know, uh, to, to just pick one thing, but, or I, I really decided, and I'm really glad I did this. We needed one book where all the information was in the same place, because if I'd written just from one angle, there would have been too much. Well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And and I just, I didn't want that to happen. I wanted there to be a resource that people could go to where all the information was in the same place. And about, you know, myths about meat, about issues with, with plant foods, about uh, plant-based diets and what, what the pros and cons of plant-based diets are and what the science actually shows about the importance of nutritional, um, uh, um, uh, nutritional adequacy during pregnancy, about um, ketogenic diets for mental health, about uh, why a paleo diet is better than a Mediterranean diet about why this, why you can't trust nutrition epidemiology. Like I really just wanted it all in there. And 
that made it a much more difficult project. But that's what I'm proud of is I somehow was able to put everything in that I wanted to put in and it came together. It didn't come together <laughs> automatically. It was work, but that's, I think what I'm really, really happy with um, because I think it'll be a lot more useful for people. I think so too. Wow. I can't wait to get my hands on it. My pre-order has been in for several months now. Um, <laughs> I, we have absolutely been looking forward to this in the community and it's so needed. Like you said, I, again, I, I've never suffered through any major mental issues, but going carnivore, learning this information helped me mentally in ways that are hard to express unless you've tried this yourself and know what it's like. And so just absolutely so grateful for you and your work and to hear your work all those years ago and get to chat with you today and to, to hear how proud you are of this book is just absolutely stellar. Where can people go to find you and connect with you and your work? Um, well, I have a, a website I've had for a long time called Diagnosis Diet. And I'm sorry that that's the name of the website, but that was the name of the book I thought I was originally going to write 12 years ago. Things change. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> that's the name of the website. Um, I, I spend a lot of time on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. So if people want to engage with me personally and ask questions, I'm pretty good at answering questions online. Um, uh, I started an Instagram account, which I'm still new at. So bear with me. Um, and I'm on, on Facebook as well. It's all, it, all the handles are always Georgia EMD and, um, yeah, but so you can learn more about the book at the website, but you can also, um, uh, uh, engage with me online if you prefer. And I'm going to be, uh, you know, various conferences throughout the year. So if you keep an eye on the website, I'm, I'll tell you like where I'm going to be, if you happen to be around and you want to come to a meeting, um, be great to meet people in person. Um, so, you know, I, I, you said that you, that you, you mentioned that your mental health improved on a carnivore diet. And I was just curious, you've probably told your listeners a hundred times already. I don't know, but can, I'm curious. Can you tell me what you experienced? It, it was similar to what I had, I guess, kind of mentioned earlier. Like I didn't think I had anxiety. I didn't think I had, you know, depression. I, I was never diagnosed with anything. It's just that I'll say it, I'll say it in this way where a, a recent guest said it, and I thought he said it really well before I tried carnivore, there were, I had problems. Something would happen. It would be problematic. I couldn't just sit down and have a think about it and, and, and solve it. It was just this big stressful, nasty thing. And it would like ruin my day or ruin my week or whatever. And I remember a stressful event happening. Somebody needed a refund. I lost a whole bunch of money and it was like, okay, cool. Here you go. And it's like, wh why did I respond that way? Why, why does, why are birds so beautiful all of a sudden? Why is the blue sky so joyous? It, it was very difficult to explain. And, and that feeling that was April of 2019. I tried it for 30 days. I did not want to stop. And it's been five years now of, of that feeling by and large, sticking around. And so again, I didn't have bipolar. I know plenty of people who do and schizophrenia, all these really serious things, but it's so meaningful for me personally to exactly the way you said it, the clean energy, the way you talk about it. It's like you go and enjoy your life and things are enjoyable and food is there. And I love the food that I eat, but you can eat or not eat. And you can have endless amounts of energy to think through things, experience things and, and do things physically. It's just, it's such a game changer. And I said it to my guests in the same way. Like, don't you think like people who aren't carnivore might not ever really understand what this was like, maybe a rare sunset or that, that wonderful moment with a spouse, but to have that feeling by and large, kind of pretty much all the time, it's just, it's wonderful. I, I love that. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's so sad that, most of us, because we have the wrong nutrition information, we've been feeding ourselves improperly our entire lives. We don't actually know how we really feel underneath all of that bad food. And it, it's like a reawakening. And it's like, you know, like I, I said to you too, like I'd never felt that well before. And when I did very strict carnivore for eight and a half months with only meat and, and water, um, I mean, it was really... Uh, it was really a life-changing experience and uh, even better than a mostly meat ketogenic diet. So there's uh, some magic here and people who are really hopeless. I think that this is a really important thing to consider trying um, to see, you know, what's possible, you know, see what's possible for you. Um, yeah. It's, it's pretty, I, I love the way you described that, like, you know, birds beautiful and, you know, things kind of rolling off rolling off of you that would have bothered you before you ruffled your feathers. <laughs> and so it just, the brain works better yep. when you, when yep. you, when you feed it right.
just the, the, the example of the 60 year old guy that you were talking about where, you know, 60 years of being hungry and you know, all of the things that come along with that, all of the medications, the doctor's visits, the feeling terrible, the brain, everything. It's just, yeah, it's such a wonderful way of living. I'm so grateful for your scientific mind and being able to go out and study this stuff, even as long ago as you did and come back and share that with everybody um, and, and, and produce your book, which is amazing. I'm so excited to read it. So thank you, Dr. Georgia Eat for everything that you have done. And thank you so very much for taking the time at your very busy life to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you very, very much, Casey. It's such a pleasure to meet you. And um, you know, let me know if there's anything else I can do. Uh, I'm I'm really very happy to have been here. And it's it's thank you for all your kind words and for letting me talk to your listeners. Absolutely. It's been a huge honor. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.